Good morning, everyone. This is Joe Welsh from Core Restaurant Marketing. And have, I have with me today, Chris Floyd, who's with Capital Restaurant Resources. And we're here to talk about a very uh, important issue, especially today in the restaurant world. And that's all about staffing. Chris, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Very busy these days. Good, nice day. good. Um, Chris, why don't we just start off by you talking a little bit about your company and what you do, and then we'll get into some questions we have for you. Sure. So Capital Restaurant Resources, I founded in 2004. Uh, I used to be a professional chef. Um, we do all levels of hospitality management recruiting, and we also offer staffing solutions uh, for hourly positions. So we're a hospitality recruiting and staffing firm, and pretty much everybody who works in the office are all industry veterans. Good, good. Well, let's kind of get to, to the heart of the issue. You know, since the pandemic, restaurants have faced a lot of difficulties, and now the challenges seem to revolve around finding and retaining employees. That's a definite problem. Let's kind of get to what you might think are the root causes of the problem, because I'm reading all kinds of things out there. And let's, let's just get your viewpoint. Right. Well, you know, I don't think that there's any one cause. I think that it's a combination of things. Um, you know, the popular uh, whipping post is unemployment benefits. And people are saying, well, people aren't coming back to work because they're being paid too much to stay at home. There's some truth to that. But I think there are also many other reasons. A big one, I think, is child care. Um, I've talked to many people who would like to come back to work, but they have, you know, their kids aren't in school. And so they have no child care solutions. Um, that's a big one. Legitimate health care concerns. Um, a lot of people have left the industry for different industries, gone back and pursued degrees they never finished. Um, and then there's a sort of this last thing, and I heard the statistic the other day that we're also at a peak. Uh, people are quitting their jobs right now at a faster rate than ever. So there's a certain amount of trust that needs to be rebuilt within the industry, I think. Um, you know, because it was such a difficult time for employers to navigate, you know, there was shut down, bring people back for PPP, shut down again, open partially, we're going to cut your salary, but we're going to bring you back. And, you know, there was a lot of back and forth. And some people feel really jerked around by that, you know, in my conversations with candidates. Um, you know, I, I've pointed out to them that it was a difficult time for all of us employers to know what was happening because every month or week you didn't know what was going to happen you know the next week so it was very challenging for everybody but you know the people that did stay employed a lot of them seem to be well not all of them but some of them feel like maybe they were jerked around by their employer or you know they're working twice as hard for half the pay and uh, so i think there's a lot of trust that needs to be rebuilt you know some, I know some chefs left because they had concerns about their staff or people getting COVID in their, in their kitchens or their staff, while the employer said, no, you have to come back. And um, so, you know, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some bridges to be mended there. Um, another kind of odd factor that people might think about is, especially for couples that had both people in the industry, um, I, I know at least, you know, one anecdotal friend said, hey, listen, you know, my wife and I have both been in this industry for a long time. You know, we can't we can't do this anymore. It's too risky if we both lose our jobs, you know. So he's like, I have an MBA. I'm going to go be a banker. You know? So uh, I don't think he wants to be a banker, but he's like, well, it seems safer. So. Um, so, yeah, there's all those reasons why people um, are not coming back and or have left. Yeah, I wanted to get that out on the table because at first, many restaurants just all talked about the government money and all those kinds of things. Sure. But as the weeks evolved and you start learning and reading more and seeing more and talking more, you find out that it is a whole lot deeper than just what the government funding is. Uh, Absolutely. And it runs really across every industry. Right. That people are just reevaluating their, their state of life, what they need to do, what they want to do, and it's just kind of going from there. Um, but now we're here. It's June. <clears throat> I'm on vacation. I know you're going on vacation soon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you see the end of the summer months, any loosening up of finding people? Well, yes. And also you hit on sort of one last point. You're going on vacation. It's summertime. People have been <laughs> cooped up for 15 months, 
not able to go on to travel, not able to go on trips. And a lot of people, even though they may have been only collecting unemployment or making far less money, they're sitting on some cash right now because, you know, they haven't been spending any money. And, you know, our family is the same way. Like, you know, we, we took a big hit, but we didn't spend any money. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't go out. We didn't travel. So I think that in addition to, you know, people maybe being reticent to come back to work, look, if you're a 20 to 30 something that's been cooped up all year and you've got some cash in the bank and you know that you can come back in September and still get a job, why wouldn't you go to the beach for the rest of the summer? In fact, I had a, I had an executive chef turn down an $85,000 chef offer because they wanted him to start July 15th and he didn't want to start until August 15th because he wanted to go to the Outer Banks for six weeks. You know, <laughs> um, as you point out, I think people have had time to evaluate their lives and they're saying, hey, you know, you only live once. When am I going to get to do this again? I'm going to go do it. I'll be able to find a job. And the employees really have the power right now um, because it's an employee market. So they, they know that they can get jobs. And so they're not too worried about it. Um, so, you know, it, it makes it all the tougher for people trying to hire people. Now, do I think it'll ease up by the end of summer? Yes, because um, one, school will start. And so anybody who had child care issues, those hopefully will be ameliorated in some manner. Um, I also think, you know, the people who decide to take the summer off, they're going to have to come back at some point. And you have uh, the unemployment benefits uh, ending, I think, in most states in July and August. So I think there will be a return to normal. And also, as school restarts and business goes back to work, a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of downtown office spaces will start to get filled and those businesses will start to come back online as well. You know, employers are in a tricky position. They know that they need to hire people and some of them, you know, are way behind the eight ball, but they also still aren't necessarily doing the same kind of numbers they did in 2019. So it's sort of, you know, they're building the plane as they're flying it, so to speak. Okay. That's good information because it, it kind of points to there. There might be a light at the end of the tunnel, which is a good thing. I think so. Yeah. I'm also seeing a lot of the... Uh, creative steps to hire people and you know there's steps there's different benefits that maybe weren't there before are you seeing a lot of that also oh indeed i mean i haven't seen free beer or donuts yet um <laughs> but i've seen um you know everything from signing bonuses i know a lot of companies are offering internal um you know uh commissions for people who bring on friends or so I think um, having referral bonuses internally is a great strategy for uh, companies. And I know a lot of people are doing that. You know, everything I've heard from, you know, a hundred bucks to even a thousand dollars. So there are signing bonuses. Um, but, you know, as we were sort of saying, I don't think it's all about the money. You know, um, I think that this is a reckoning for the restaurant industry and that they're going to have to be a little bit more flexible and offer more sort of quality of life perks to their employees to um, to bring people back. Because, I mean, the industry, you know, is really fun and exhilarating if you love doing it and you love hospitality. I did it for a long time and loved working in kitchens. And, and so I think it can be a really fun business. But I think businesses could do a lot to take out some of the pain points that, um, you know, really... I think drag people down. I mean, we all know that there's, you know, these are 50 to 60 hour work weeks typically for the industry, for, for management. That's fine, but make sure people are getting vacation time. Make sure they're getting a long weekend here and there. You know, make sure they're taking care of it. I've been talking to restaurant owners who are currently, especially in kind of smaller restaurants that are currently only open Wednesday through Sunday, partially because they're just getting reopened and they don't have enough staff. But I had one chef tell me the other day, he said, you know, I don't think we're ever going to open again on Monday and Tuesday. Um, you know, we're doing great business Wednesday through Sunday. Um, if I don't have if I don't have to cover seven days, then I just have, you know, himself, the executive chef, a sous chef, a general manager and a, and a floor manager. You don't need to hire a whole nother set of managers just to cover those shifts. 
and everybody knows they're going to have off Monday, Tuesday. So from a staffing standpoint, that's a much easier model for a restaurant to do. Now, I know like, you know, people downtown are playing big rents and, and want to try to maximize their profits. But I think you have to ask yourself, well, how much business are we really doing on those off days, whether it be Sunday, Monday or Monday, Tuesday, depending on your location? So I think um, looking at the models, you know, do you need to be open until one in the morning? You know, because people, you, you know, then they miss the metro and they're there in the restaurant really late. So, you know, restaurants might consider, you know, maybe closing at 11 isn't okay or, you know, nine or 10 on the weekdays. So I think there's a lot of pain points that, that uh, restaurants could do better um, to make their employees' lives a little bit better. And it's those little things I feel like that go a long way. Um, a lot of restaurants now offer dining allowances, gym memberships, sort of, you know, parking, all these different sort of perks that are important and that we see when, you know, people are getting job offers and, and negotiating. You know, you mentioned two very good points, uh, one of which is uh, treating treating your employees like family, basically. Right. Yeah, really making them feel that they're part of something, that they're loved and you care and all those kinds of things goes a long way. The other thing, as the pandemic first came in and many restaurants adjusted their hours, right, their profitability went up. <laughs> right, right. That's what I mean. So, so I think if you combine, okay, let's find the good in, in, in improving the profitability and then do the right things on the other side, you might have a better model. Well, indeed. And, and I think that, you know, like we were saying, if, if you're not busy on those days and then you don't have to pay, you know, one or two more salaries to cover those shifts, you know, it just makes it a much better uh, deal. And, and, and when you take all that money out, how much money are you really making on those off days? What is the profitability? I mean, if you think about, you know, fine dining, you know, tasting menu type only restaurants that are, um, you know, are at limited capacity, you know, they book up well in advance. So they can just be open, you know, on Wednesday through Sunday, and it's not a big deal to them. Um, you know, if you go to, if you go to France and, and go to Michelin starred restaurants, a lot of them open are only open Monday through Friday, which blew me away when I was there. I was like, what? I'm like, yeah, you want to come here? We're open Monday through Friday. Yep. And, uh, you know, so it's a different mindset. And I think that um, restaurateurs are seeing light and are moving to more, you know, models that are that are more employee looking in terms of quality of life. Yeah. Let's talk about moving forward and the importance of training. Right. You know, because in many cases, you've got new employees coming in new employees doing different things. Do you see training moving more to the forefront and more people really investing in training? Yes, and I think it's that's really important. And, you know, coming from, you know, being a cook and a chef, you know, we all always take great pride in being able to train people. And that's one of the things that sort of sticks with you when you can take a dishwasher and make them a prep cook and into gar manger and then a saute cook and, you know, really teach them something and then he's making more money or she's making more money and, you know, they stand up proud. And um, so I think that that's very important. And I think it's a great um, resource for restaurants. And, and we're seeing that now in terms of staffing and people hiring people, a lot of restaurants, you know, for front of their house, like just saying, Hey, give me somebody with a kind personality and I can teach them the rest. And I think in the kitchen, it's, the, you know, the, the sentiment is the same. I mean, you know, no offense to anybody, but you know, kitchen work is not rocket science. You know, it's, it's a craft. It's a, it's a, it's a trade that you can teach people. And so uh, I think that's really important. I think, um, you know, the DC government is making strides to re reinvigorate their uh, hospitality high school program. And I know RMW is uh, working on some training programs. And I think all this is really important because there are a ton of jobs out here and there's still a high rate of unemployment in the city. Okay. You know, long term, how do you feel the restaurant industry needs to change or should it change to compete with other industries for hiring the right people? Um, I think it's all the things we've been talking about. Um, like I said, I think it's a we're at an inflection point in the industry where um, you know the 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 sort of it's an employee driven market. They have the power now. They they know that they they can be choosy. You know, even though we're very busy and we're we're getting people in jobs, the candidates are taking their time because they want to pick the right place and they want to, you know, 
get the thing that's where they're going to have advancement, where they're going to have training, where they're going to, as you point out, feel loved, feel appreciated. So this sort of model of like, hey, here's a job, take it or leave it. I think restaurants have to be much more enticing in, in what they can offer from a monetary standpoint, from a benefit standpoint, from a continuing education standpoint, and to like, you know, lifestyle perks like I was talking about, dining allowances, gym memberships. Uh, I've even heard of dog walkers. Um, so, so all these things the restaurant industry could do better. Um, you know, I'm a proponent of single pair single payer healthcare. I think if uh, if there were Medicare for all, it would be a big boon to small businesses and allow people to move around a bit more because right now, small restaurants and small businesses have a disadvantage against the larger companies because they don't necessarily provide healthcare benefits. And what that means is the playing field for competition for labor is not really even. Um, so I think that would hopefully be something, I don't know if it'll ever happen in our lifetimes, but who knows. But um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly we're going to see salary and wage increases, inflation in the short term, which is going to lead to higher prices in restaurants. And I think in places where the labor market is expensive, we can all expect to pay, you know, a little bit more for our latte. You know, that's interesting what you said there at the end, because I saw an article this morning, which frankly, I never expected to see. And it talked about how small manufacturers are having difficulty finding people because they have to compete with fast food places for wages. Right. I mean, you usually never see it that way. <laughs> right. But like, you know, I, you know, if, if the fast food, you know, company provides healthcare benefits and the small manufacturer is less than 50 people and doesn't, that's what I mean. So a lot of people weigh that into their equation. And although you can purchase healthcare on the open market, a lot of people still kind of count on their employers for that. And I don't understand that mindset exactly, but that it's still out there. Okay. Um, three years out, what do you think the industry looks like with regard to staffing? Do you see any changes at all? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the marketplace, we will reach equilibrium. Um, I do expect to see, though, you know, long-term higher salaries and wages. These aren't aren't, aren't going to go backwards at any point. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more automation, to be honest. Um, one of the solutions that people have been coming up with for these staffing issues is getting these apps or, you know, scan codes that they can, you know, you go to a restaurant and you scan your app and, and then you just, you put in your credit card and then you're just ordering and they just have food runners and bussers. So you can run a whole floor with maybe two captains and two bussers and two food runners. You don't need dedicated servers for every table. I think that applies to, uh, you know, upscale casual, fast casual, and certainly casual restaurant groups. I mean, at a certain point, if you're paying a certain amount, you want, you know, you want a, a server. You want, you know, if you're at a white tablecloth restaurant, you want a server. But, you know, if I'm sitting on a dock drinking oysters and or drinking beer and eating oysters. <laughs> I do it very fast, so it's very it's simultaneous. Um, the uh, Then, uh, you know, who cares if you have a server? I don't care, you know, so, and I, I've used these apps and they're very, very efficient. I mean, you kind of think about a beer and it appears on your table. So, because, you know, the order is going directly from your phone to the kitchen or to the bar. And then, you know, it's up in minutes and, and a runner takes it out. It's not like a server has to stop at three tables, take three orders, go to the POS system, put them in. So, you know, for certain scenarios, I think that you're going to see that and, and that, you know, automation will continue to take over. Um, I'm really interested to see, you know, we had this boom in delivery services and food to go and, you um, all these things. I'm curious to see how they adjust to the market as people go back to, to, to eating in restaurants. I mean, those things obviously aren't going to go away, but I would imagine there would be fewer of them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't I don't think it looks all that different, except that, you know, people are going to have to get paid more. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Yeah, I think, you know, when you talk about the automations, you know, it's kind of like going from the Wawa where you just order at the kiosk right. to the restaurant. Exactly. You know? and, exactly. And frankly, it is a very efficient process. It's so. very efficient, you know, and, and I mean, 
you can still have, you know, the human touch, the hospitality touch in that scenario. I mean, you can still, you know, somebody, you know, greeting you at the door and thanking you for coming and, you know, checking on your table and making sure you're having a nice time. All those things are still hospitality, but, you know, it just sort of, you can eliminate some of the steps, I think, in the service process. Good point, good point. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for your time. This has been a really good interview from the standpoint of seeing what's going on and some of the reasons behind what's going on, but also looking at the future as well. So here again, I appreciate your time and this interview will be viewed by many, I'm sure, because it is such a critical issue right now. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate your time and uh, I hope you have a great vacation and a, a lovely summer. And I, you know, I think things will even out come September. It'll, it'll yeah, get better. All right. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Bye.